During the Civil War, the Battle of Stones River took place in the U.S. state of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It was a very well-known fight. Thanks to the university, Murfreesboro has grown a lot in recent years, and a lot of people have moved there. In 1984, a college student was involved in a crime that is still talked about in Murfreesboro. On May 31, 1984, a farmer in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, was going home when he saw something that scared him. The farmer saw some clothes lying around in the field, so he went over to see what was going on. When he did that, he saw that a girl's body was under the clothes. She was only wearing a bra, two pairs of jeans, and a dark jacket to hide herself. One of the jacket's sleeves was around her neck. The first pair of jeans was found to be hers, and the second pair was found to be men's. The police also found a pair of underwear in one of her hands. She was named Laura Salmon, who was 18 years old. She was born in Tennessee on October 6, 1965. Laura was a local college student at the time. She studied at Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and she also worked as a cashier at the Kroger supermarket in the area. The autopsy found that Laura died because her head was hit by something hard. The rocks that were near her body seemed to be the weapon. The blood on those rocks and other things showed that she had been hit in the head up to ten times. During the investigation, the medical examiner also found that Laura had slept with someone in the last 24 or 48 hours before her death. There were no accidents or other signs that it wasn't on both sides' terms. The pair of men's pants that were on top of Laura's body were, of course, one of the most important clues for the police. Investigators found male DNA on the jeans, but it wasn't from the man who was involved with Laura. Instead, it was from a different man. This DNA likely came from the person who did it. Unfortunately, DNA testing was just getting started, so detectives couldn't do much more with the DNA than store it. Then, the investigators worked on making a timeline of events in the hopes that it would help them figure out what happened. Laura's day started with her going to work at the Kroger shopping store. The store's records showed that she left around 1 o'clock. After that, she was supposed to go to Middle Tennessee State University for a meeting with some office staff and to check her grades. She also planned to go swimming at her grandmother's house and at the university, but she never made it to either place. Laura's car was found near a store, which was miles from where her body was found. Investigators looked through the car and couldn't find any DNA that didn't belong to Laura. But interestingly, they did find a hair from another country. It was kept in the same place as the DNA proof they got from the genes. Investigators also found dirt in the wheel wells, which is also important. The FBI lab found that they all fit together and that there was a good chance that Laura's car was on the road right next to where the crime happened. If this meant that someone killed Laura and then drove her car back to her place of work, it wasn't a good lead for anything other than making the police think the killer knew Laura. People said that Laura was at a nearby nightclub the night before she was killed. The witnesses said that Laura was dancing with a young man they didn't know, but the police couldn't find him. Laura's body was found in a place that high school and college students often used as Lover's Lane. They went there to have parties, campfires, etc. The next idea was that Laura met a guy at a nightclub after she got off work, and the two of them went to Lover's Lane. There, Laura turned down the guy who didn't know her, and he killed her. Since the police couldn't figure out who the young man was, they talked to David Kyle Gilly, who was Laura's high school boyfriend. He was known to be jealous, but he had a good reason not to be there. His stepfather told the cops that David was home all day when Laura died, so he couldn't have done it, so he could not have been the one who did it. Just when investigators had no more leads to follow, a woman in Nashville, Tennessee, called the police with a possible tip. She said that a man named John Taylor had attacked her. During the whole thing, she says that Taylor told her that he would do to her what he did to Laura. When the cops asked him about it, Taylor said he didn't hit the woman and that he hadn't talked about Laura or had anything to do with her. A background check showed that Taylor and Laura both went to the same college. He even went to the same gym and spa. 
the Olympus Athletic Club and Spa. Taylor went to the same fraternity parties and events that Laura did. Even more important, Taylor was close to the university on the day Laura died. Taylor had a habit of hitting his girlfriends or other women he was with. Investigators then had FBI analysts match Taylor's hair to the foreign hair they found in Laura's car. All of this made it more likely that he was the killer. They got a report from the FBI saying that the hair they found in the car looked like John Taylor's. Right, the case is finished, and another jerk has been caught, but not quite. At the time, it was still going to be a long time before hair could be tested for mitochondrial DNA. About 20% of the people could have had hair like that. Of course, this wasn't enough proof to put Taylor in jail, even though it seemed like everything was settled. In this case, there would be a few more turns. Investigators found nothing that linked him to the crime scene or proved that he was with Laura that day. The crime scene had a pair of men's jeans with a 36-inch inseam and a 30-inch waist. Taylor was a small guy, so the shorts wouldn't have fit him. Investigators had to move on to other suspects because they had no choice. They looked into more than 100 people over the years, but nothing came of it. At her grave, Laureen Mackey, Laura's mother, made a promise to her daughter. She told Laura that she would do what was right. Laureen wasn't sure how she was going to keep that promise, but she thought that was the last thing she could do for Laura. Before help finally came, many long years went by. One of Laura's friends at college was Dan Goodwin. He took her out a few times in the last few nights of her life. Dan asked her if she wanted to go see a movie, and on May 27, 1984, they went to the theater to see an afternoon showing of The Natural, which starred Robert Redford. Dan told Laura's mother at her funeral that he would help find the person who killed her. Dan got a job as a writer at the Daily News Journal in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, after he graduated from college. He wrote about the cops there. In 1987, he wrote about a number of close cases, including Laura's. Dan knew that he was more interested in actually being a police officer than just writing about it. Dan stopped being a journalist after a few years and became a police officer. Laura Salmon was the very first cold case that he was given. Dan's first step was to send all of the proof back to the forensic lab so that it could be tested. DNA technology had come a long way, and new tests had to be done. Dan looked into other leads while that was going on. One of them came from a high school student. A student at Oakland High School talked about the Laura Salmon case in the year 2000. Everyone heard that the student's father killed a girl in 1984 and threw her body away. David Patterson was the boy's father. He had a record with the police for a serious attack. Dan wanted to talk to Patterson, but when he tried, he found out that Patterson was no longer living. He had been shot and killed. Dan, of course, still chose to keep going with the flow. The children of Patterson gave them their DNA. The DNA was matched to the DNA of a man that was found at the scene of the crime. It didn't match, so he was no longer a suspect. Dan went back to John Taylor, who had been a suspect in the case at first. His DNA did not match either. Dan also gave a sample of his DNA, in case you were asking. After testing, it was clear that Dan was not to blame. Dan then focused on one man who had slipped under the radar during the first probe. David Gilly was the name that caught his attention. David was Laura's boyfriend in high school. He was a year younger than she was. The police didn't believe him at first because his dad told them a different story. Dan, on the other hand, found that a witness directly contradicted that story. On the day that Laura's body was found, the witness saw David Gilly driving her car. She saw him not too far from the road that led to where Laura was. The witness said that David's face was blank and that he was just looking straight ahead. She was able to pick him out of a group of photos and from Laura's car. Dan also saw that David had a history of being violent toward women. This had salmon for Laura. When he was mad at her, he would sometimes grab her by the head and hit it against cars, school lockers, or whatever was close by. He even hit her sometimes. He broke two of her front teeth once. Dan couldn't believe that David Gilly was ruled out so quickly in the first probe. 
David was about 62 inches tall, and the men's shorts that were found at the crime scene would have fit him perfectly. Then Dan asked Jerry Findlay to help him with the case. He figures out what happened at a crime scene. Jerry found tiny drops of blood on the jeans. It was a splash from a medium-speed collision. This kind of mess normally happens when a blunt object like a rock hits someone. Most of the blood spots were right above the knee. This meant that the person who did this was on his knees when he hit Laura with the rocks. All of this just shows the police that the pair of men's jeans belonged to the person who killed Laura. It was already thought that Laura's blood was on the jeans, but DNA tests proved it. Then Dan found David Gilly in Florida. By that time, Gilly had been separated twice and was working for the Manatee County Department of Public Works. He had a record, which wasn't a big surprise. Gilly was arrested for abuse, trying to break in and trying to get away from the police. When Dan asked Gilly about what happened to Laura, he said again that he had nothing to do with it and that he wasn't to blame. In a strange turn of events, Gilly did say that he possibly owned the jeans. When the police told him they thought the owner of the jeans was the person who did it, he quickly asked for a lawyer. The investigators then got a sample of David Gilly's spit. On May 31, 2000, DNA tests showed that Gilly was the person whose DNA was found at the crime scene. This meant that Gilly was the person who killed Laura, when it had been 16 years since the crime. David Gilly was finally caught. Dan did what he said he would do to help Laura's mother solve the case, and Laura's mother did what she said she would do to make sure justice was done. People thought that jealousy was behind it. He thought that if Gilly couldn't have Laura, no one else could either. He didn't like it when she made new friends when she went to college while he was still in high school. He would follow her around a lot. Laura's mom tried to get Laura to get an order against Gilly, but Laura was too scared. Investigators think that Gillies lured Laura to the empty lover's lane, where he hit her in the head with rocks over and over again. Gilly took off his jeans and left them at the scene of the crime when he saw that there was blood on them. He then took Laura's car to her place of work, where it would be found later. David Gilly went to court in September 2006. The defense said that the fact that another man's DNA was found at the scene of the crime showed that someone else was there. The judges never thought that any other DNA found at the scene of the crime belonged to the real killer. Gilly was found guilty of all the charges against him, and he was given a life sentence in prison.